What's up guys and welcome to the Rebalance podcast where we dive into topics that matter most when it comes to overcoming struggles, injuries and finding balance in your life. Everybody's idea of balance is that bit different so my goal is to give you different perspectives, practical tips as well as expert insights into what it means to live a balanced life. My name is Robbie Cassidy, I'm a physiotherapist and a health coach and I've been helping people reignite their love for challenge, overcome their fear and find more balance in their life through the process of self-development. So let's get into it. What's up, guys, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, we welcome on Brian Keane from Brian Keane Fitness. Brian, thanks so much for jumping on. Robbie, absolute pleasure. Really looking forward to chatting. And I said to you just before we went online, a massive congrats. I know a few episodes ago, you hit 150, and that's a huge, like a milestone is 100 episodes for people. So I know you're doing great work. So I just wanted to kind of give you a virtual pat on the back for that, too. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And to even go back to it, to, to look at the starting of the podcast, uh, it, was, it was yourself that got me on it. Because it was, I was I initially started online through Paul Dermody. He said you have to check out this stuff, whatever all the all the work you were doing. And I think you had something that it was like until you get to twenty episodes, you don't really understand what you're doing. So I I had that goal in my head, right? Let's get to twenty first, and if I can do twenty, then we'll see how it goes after that. So it is nice, it is nice to to keep it going, and I do appreciate all the work you do. So thank you so much for that, and um, for 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 keeping me on task for it. But. I don't even know how I'm going to introduce you, Brian. I, I would start off with he's a he's a first he's a PT he's a coach he's a speaker he's a podcaster he's an author he's an athlete. There's so many so many ways to go about it. So, how would you describe yourself in one sentence? Oh, you gave me this right before we went on air. How I describe myself personally is a very very lucky bastard. But in terms of to provide value for what I do, probably online fitness coach, nutritionist, author, and podcaster. Okay, very nice, very nice. And with that, what what has led you to that? What's led you down that path of starting off? When I initially came across you, it was a long time ago. It was the GAA Lean Body Program. And from there, it, it, it all kind of spiraled off. What were the certain steps that you went along that path to go from focusing on GAA? And now you have so much more around you, I guess. Yeah, I've been very lucky particularly where I'm at now, because I'm in a place with my business. We were talking right before on air, before we went on air, that I've got the fitness business kind of up and running now. I've got people that work there. I get to incorporate and coach on my programs, my GEA Lean Body program, my favorite program. Like I'm a GEA head. So it's the program that I could never get rid of because I just love it so much. But I also have my BKF online coaching program and that fitness side of the business between the podcast sponsorships, the books, the programs, it kind of runs itself in the last few months, I've been working on building up my business consulting. So working with people, growing their business. And I have this kind of unusual story that led me into fitness initially. I was a primary school teacher for four years and that was my quote unquote real job. And I, for three and a half of those, or three and a half years teaching in a school in London, but for two of those years, I worked as a personal trainer at nighttime. So in a gym at nighttime, I took classes in Chiswick Park in West London in the evenings and at weekends and during summer holidays. And it took me kind of two years to build up a little bit of confidence or probably enough confidence to transition out of teaching to try and make what was at the time one-to-one personal training in a gym a success. And in 2014, I decided, you know what, I'm going to finally give this a go. This is my third attempt. I went broke twice on two attempts. I'm just making really stupid mistakes. A lot we can get into a completely separate podcast probably in itself. But long story short, I moved back home in 2014, moved back in at my mom and dad. My sister gave me her old little Toyota Yaris, like one of those cars that when you close the door, all four windows fall down. Um, but it got me to the gym initially and I was able to take PT clients. And I said it in six months, if I haven't got enough revenue coming in, I'll go back and I'll start applying for a teaching job for September. But it went the other direction completely. It was, I ended up having to bring on a second trainer. Funny, you mentioned Paul Dermody and Paul was the trainer I had to bring on originally to help me clear some of that waiting list that I had for people that were coming in to work with me. And in 2016, then I moved online for more freedom. And I was one of the probably, I won't say one of the first, definitely one of the first Irish online coaches in that space. Um, and I was able to grow a very successful business very quickly 
online. I had grown up a decent social media following, but I had gone very niche with my GA players alongside my normal fitness program. And over the last few years, it's just evolved. I now do a lot of speaking between corporate events and different business events. As I mentioned, I'm building up what is effectively becoming a nearly separate business entity with the business consulting element. And again, I've got a couple of more that are on the list for the next few years just to kind of keep me driven and keep me jumping out of bed every morning. But uh, yeah, it's been a a wide, wild ride. Like when I'm chatting to guys, yourself, Robbie, but even lads that are younger, I had Oshin Mulligan on my podcast. It's going out this Monday. And he's like, man, I followed you since Snapchat days. And he's like exploding on social at the minute with half a yeah. million followers on Instagram. And he's like, you're the old, one of the OGs. And I'm like, wow. I was like, well, I'm in that category. <laughs> like I, I was chatting to Rob Lipset earlier today. Um, and I was like, Rob, do you realize we're in the OG category now? We're, we're, we're the people that are like, they're the old dudes that are in it. Um, and he was laughing and it's true. So it's been crazy, been a wild ride, but something that's been amazing all the same because I love what I do. Yeah, that's because that's the the perfect one. It is it is an OG, or you are one of the OGs at this stage, really. From from especially in the west of Ireland, I didn't I didn't I couldn't really pick out anyone else. Maybe Pat Divley and yourself around yeah, Pat about the was same ahead time. of me. Yeah, Pat was someone that was really in, inspirational for me. Pat was doing it. I remember following Pat on social when I was still teaching in London. Um, so we got to give oh. him credit. He's the one that paved the way, and then I followed in the footsteps and possibly others behind us. Then, <laughs> and and when you did take off, uh, Brian, what was it? What was it? Do you think? attracted people so much to it what was it that you really started to get people to come in the door well there's two answers to that robbie one is the what brought people in the door as an influencer in terms of a following count and then the other is what brought people in the door for business that actually translated into revenue the fitness influencer approach was i started to compete in fitness model shows back in 2014 and they were relatively new at the time but one of the things that I vowed to myself back in 2014 was I was going to try and do everything I could to make the fitness business work. But by accident, I came across a book by Gary Vee, who's Gary Vaynerchuk at the time called Crush It, way before he was Gary Vee and had all these channels. But I read this book about building social media. So I said, okay, I'm going to start documenting what I'm doing. And about a month or two into it, I realized that this is actually kind of boring. Like I'm just going to the gym. I'm not doing anything really different. Although there's not that many people posting online. I said, I'm going to sign up to one of these fitness competitions, fitness model shows, and that will make me different. It'll differentiate me. So that brought a lot of people into my ecosystem in terms of my social media. And then from there, it was just putting out consistent content, trying to provide value, lots of different things and different strategies I've used over the years. The business side then was very much down to niching with the GA market. Like my GA lean body program, which is one of my most successful programs, one of the most successful things I've ever created is down to me fixing and creating a program that solved a pain point that I had. And it brought so many other players in. So I played underage with Galway and it was in that inter-county setup and played football was my life until I hit my early 20s. And But I would regularly ask those strength and conditioning coaches in the underage setup, well, do you know what? I want to get a six pack or I want to build a bit of muscle. And they'd always laugh at me. And they're like, look, you don't need those mirror muscles. You don't need those. And then I'd go to a PT or I'd go to a bodybuilder in the gym and they'd explain to me about hypertrophy and bodybuilding splits and compound lifts and all these things. And I would ask, well, do you think this will negatively impact my performance on the pitch? And they're like, well, I don't know. So when I started to go down my qualification route in strength and conditioning and sports nutrition, and I was a qualified PT before this, I thought there has to be a way to combine these worlds. And so I created that program and lo and behold, there was... Well, thousands at this point of GA players who were the same, who are like, do you know what? I want to be fitter. I want to be faster, but I also want to get a six pack and I want to build muscle and I want to look better. And that really, that's what brought the business to a really another level because I was already doing the fitness coaching. I was high ticket and I had a good setup with that. I had coaches underneath me, but then when I set up the GA Lean Body Program, I got first to market on this program and it just went woof, gangbusters nearly from the get-go. Um, so the answer is kind of twofold, depending on the influencer and the social media following and the other from the business. And then it just kind of organically grew from there. Yeah, so there is, there's always a couple of sides to it. Um, and with the Lean Body Program, I like the idea that, you, as you said there, it, it was like first to market as well. Like I hadn't seen it anywhere else. I, I still remember, this is funny now, on Facebook, the ad in the small section on the side, it was you playing football. Did you have the Galway jersey on at the time? I, had a, I had a couple. Had yeah, that, that video that video got a million views within the first week. It was an ad. 
uh, an, an organic ad, yeah. million view organic ad on Facebook. Yeah, crazy. Just from people sharing it, going, sharing it with their friends and teammates. It was crazy. Yeah, I couldn't believe it when it when I seen it at the time. I was like, geez, this is interesting because it's not something that I would have come across before. But then I guess when you look at that and you look at the transition from being a primary school teacher and then you started to move out then into into fitness, there's obviously a certain appetite for risk. Would you say that you have? Weirdly enough, I'm quite risk averse in, okay. in most areas of life. Yeah, I very I do a lot of pre mortems, which means that I will always try and visualize a worst case scenario before making any decision, and then I just try and minimize the downsides. Like I think when it comes to entrepreneurship or business or probably anything in life, but particularly things like relationships, romantic, personal, business, or otherwise, you ask what's the upside, what's the downside, and how can I manage the downside? And I think once you're able to manage the downside, i.e control for the risk because there's always going to be risk in every decision you make. You walk out the front door here, you can get hit by a bus. There's a risk to that. The probability is low, but there's a risk. As you go up the chain then with romantic relationships, with business relationships, with decisions you make, the, the risk tends to be higher. So I still put everything through that filter on what's the downside and how do I minimize against that downside and minimize against that risk? And then just asking the very simple question, is the juice worth the squeeze? I stole that directly from one of the lads I used to go on the pole with in college. Like when he'd be like, you're putting all this effort into one of the girls. He's like, is the juice worth the squeeze? Like you've been talking to her for fucking 40 minutes. <laughs> he was like, he goes, you know, nothing's happening here. But I take that and I still apply it to business when it comes to, is it worth putting all the time and effort into this book or into this course or into this program? And you just ask the question, is the juice worth the squeeze? So once you do those two things, you can manage for risk quite effectively. Yeah, that's a that's a perfect analogy because it is something that I, I've actually started using myself randomly in the last year or two. It's like, if you're going out and the boys are like, oh, we go to another place. And it's like, Jesus, it could be it could be five, six in the morning at a certain stage. Like, is the juice worth the squeeze at this stage? Do we need to continue on or can we pull back? But it's uh, no, that's that's definitely an analogy that I that I use all the time as well. Um, In terms of that, then, OK, so let's say if you're risk averse, then there has to be when we look at the what you've been doing over the last couple of years, especially moving into the ultra scene madness. I work with a, a lot of ultra runners myself. It's a different mindset. It's a different mindset. What? is it that draws you towards that? There must be some love a challenge in that, is there? Yeah, it's funny because what drew me to Ultra initially was probably what drew a percentage of people, but probably not the majority. And that's was my life was really soft when I got into Ultra. Like it was very easy. And, and I'd make the argument, it's still pretty easy. All my loved ones are healthy and well at the minute. I've got great people in my life. I have a very successful business. I, I'm in full control of everything that I do for the most part. That when you have all these amazing things, you can sit in the gratitude that I do, but you can also get very complacent with that. And one of the things that keeps me the happiest if I have to pull on the old self-awareness lens is when I'm being challenged in some capacity. Now that might be a business challenge. That might be a physical challenge. That might be something completely that I just need to up my game for. And what drew me to ultra initially was the fact that I hadn't been challenged in quite a while. I had been doing the bodybuilding competitions, fitness model competitions, and I did really well in those. I went pro in 2014, which means I could compete for money. I was traveling around doing fitness model competitions and shows and photo shoots. And that was by all means quite difficult at the time. And then after that, I just focused on the business. And then when the business started to explode in 2016, I started working on the first book, The Fitness Mindset, which again, did better than I ever dreamed. That was 16 weeks on the Amazon bestseller list, went bestseller in all the stores it was in. I went, did way better than I ever thought. And then in 2017, the back end of it, early 2018, when I got into ultra, I was like, do you know what? I really need to challenge myself for something here. And it came off the back of, I was at an event in Amsterdam and a Tony Robbins business mastery event. And I met someone who's since become a really good friend of mine, Tom Otten, who's an ultra runner. He'd been on my podcast several times. And he was telling me about this event, Marathon de Saab. It's six back-to-back -back marathons through the Sahara Desert. It's self-sufficient. You need to have a venom pump within arm's reach at all time in case you get bitten by a snake. It was just crazy. Insane to me what he was telling me. And I remember I missed the entire next speaker that came out because I was on Google going through Marathon de Saab and the stories and all these crazy things. And I thought, wow, that is so cool. And then I didn't think that much more about it. 
I was like, I'd love to do something like that. And it kind of fell out of my head for a little bit. And then I was like, oh, do you know what? I'm not a runner. I'm five foot eight. I'm built like a hobbit. I'm a bodybuilder, GA player. I'm not built to run a marathon. Don't mind six. And then about three months later, I was sitting on my phone. I remember this. I was sitting outside a gym post-workout about to post up a motivational quote, something along the lines of fear behind every fear is a person you want to be or one of those fear-based quotes. It was when trends and quotes were very popular on Instagram. And I sat there for the first time ever this happened to me. I was like, I can't post this. I was like, you're a fucking hypocrite. I was like, you can't post this thing about fear when you literally heard about this race a few months ago and you talked yourself out of it because of all the excuses you gave. That's the thing with excuses. They sound so good to everybody. They don't sound good to anybody else except for yourself, but they sound very convincing to yourself. And I was like, oh shit. So I went home that night. I put down my deposit for the race and said, I'll just figure it out. I'll figure out how to do this. I've never ran a marathon, don't mind six but I'll figure it out. And then I, I posted that fear quote. And I was like, well, at least I don't feel like an imposter now posting this or a hypocrite posting this. And that's what led me down the road of ultra. Like Marathon de Saab was the first one I ever did. I ran my first marathon four months before that in Dubai to prepare for it in 2018 and then did the Marathon de Saab in April 2018. And I won't say I got bitten by the bug, because I still I'm very vocal about how much I hate running. Um, but I like the physical <laughs> challenge of it. And I like having ran it's funny because i love these conversations robbie and i love podcasting and chatting and i write books and i've written four working on my fifth but i don't like writing i like having written and running is very similar to that i don't like running i like having ran whereas i'll do crossfit and bodybuilding and strength and conditioning workouts all day i love those styles of sessions so that's what kind of led me down the path kind of a, an unusual way to fall into it but a combination of not wanting to feel like a hypocrite, needing to challenge myself and just needing somewhere else to take my fitness direction because things like CrossFit come quite easily to me. Bodybuilding comes quite easily. Like I'm, I'm built for that world. Like I'm short, I'm stocky. I put on muscle really easily, but I'm as far away from a runner as you can get physically and probably biomechanically. But it's the challenge of doing those extreme events that motivates me to do the daily runs. And that's why I still do them to this day. There's something that I'll continue for another while um, because there's a few more that I'd like to tick off the list. Nice. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. And since then, you've obviously done the, the 230 kilometers in the Arctic and the 100 mile desert, Nevada as well. So it's a lot, it's a lot, a lot to, a lot to cover. With that, I, I love the idea of throwing yourself in the deep end and figuring your way out. That's a, that's a real approach that I tried to adopt as well because I think that it's when you do, First off, it's a certain way to build confidence. There's no question. It's a certain way to build confidence in yourself because a lot of times when you're looking at something at face value, it looks a lot more challenging than it is. Like I often say this to my friends, like about, they're like, oh, I'd like to start an online business, but it just seems like such a an, a big thing to do. And it's like, you're looking at the end result. You're looking at when you're sitting down and all that. It's a small process. You just get it started and then you just keep showing up every day for a week. And then do it for next next week and the next week and just can, can, can or continue doing that for a year and see where you're at. I think when you look at something face value though, there's a lot of uh, a lot of as you said, perfect quote. What was it? Excuses are. Can you repeat that quote? Yeah, excuses, it, 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 excuses sound great to you, but just shit to everybody else. I've got a few different ways of saying that, but it's how I remind myself. I'm like, no one gives a fuck about your excuses, Brian. Just come on and get it done. That's it. But I love that. I love that quote. How have you used that? I guess that way of. I know I, I was watching one of your talks as well, and you you talked about having no plan B. How do you bring that mindset to a new, let's say, a new task that you want to do, a new race? If you wanted to challenge yourself, I know you went to, I can't even pronounce the name of the country. Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan, yeah, yeah recently. Yeah. How do you start to break that initial fear, an initial wall of to, 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 to get yourself in there? I had to have systems, Robbie, initially, because the thing is with confidence, and I use this analogy in the second book, We Warrior Mindset, that if you, it's like legs on a table, that if you've only one leg on a table, it's really easy to rock that and knock that similar to your confidence. But every time you set a small goal for yourself or you keep a promise you set for yourself, you add a small leg to that table. And then if you hit a big goal, you add a big leg to it. And when it came to the initial phases, which is probably where I can provide the most value here, I had to go with the no plan B that you mentioned. Marathon the Saab for me was my biggest growth experience in my life, probably outside of the birth of my daughter. Biggest growth experience in my life was a challenge I chose for myself and was something that I didn't believe I could do until I finished it. 
And because of that, I got so much confidence from it. Too much, actually, in some cases, because actually I went to do an ultra in Barcelona that November that I didn't train for. And I thought, you know what? I don't need to train for it. I'm after running six marathons in the Sahara. Why well, don't need to train for a one in 76 kilometers in Barcelona? And I fucking DNF'd it. I didn't finish it. So th- there's definitely danger in the dose on that. Again, it's one of my favorite failures because that seed for failure planted the tree for future success when I ran through the Arctic the next February because I had to take a completely different approach. I was like, if I go to the Arctic with this approach, I'm literally going to die. So that again, put the fear of God into me. But when it came to that no plan B, for me, historically, if I give myself an out, and I won't even say historically, because this is still true to this day. If I give myself an out, I tend to take it. And yeah. we're all a bit like that in some areas. So one of the mindsets I have going into these challenges and these races is unless I'm getting pulled out in a helicopter or by an ambulance, I'm going to finish it. And I got a great piece of advice from Dean Carnassus, who's one of the top ultra runners in the world, was on my podcast. And he said, never stop at a checkpoint on an ultra. And it's a great me- metaphor for life because on an ultra, if you have a hundred mile race, Every 10 miles, you might have a checkpoint and you go in, you get your water, there might be some food, et cetera. And it's so easy when you're sitting down to be like, I'm actually not going to get back up again. Do you know what? I'm just going to call it a day. Everything hurts. My feet are sore. My body's broken. I'm tired, et cetera. But if you go back out on the course, you're not going to run five miles back to the checkpoint because you're like, oh, fuck it. I'm already five miles past it. And that's a really good tool that I use with things in life. I never make decisions for races on my couch. I'll never sit and watch, you know, whatever's on TV, Sky Sports News, and be like, oh, I'm going to do an Ironman today, or I'm going to do a 100-mile ultramarathon. I decide I'm going to do those things when I'm in the hurt locker, when I'm out on a run and I'm fucking struggling, because that's what it's going to feel like when I'm there. And sometimes the juice is worth the squeeze. I'll want to launch a book or I'll have priorities with family or loved ones or holidays or things I want to go and do. And I'll say, actually, I'm not going to prioritize this. This isn't the time. But then there's other occasions where I'm like, yeah, Kyrgyzstan, a great example. That was a really kind of mind fuckery one though, more so than any other, because I trained for Kyrgyzstan, which was going to be 230 kilometers up the Tian Shan, which is the mountain range from Kyrgyzstan overlooking to China. And I trained like a demon for the, for the four months in the lead up to that. I was probably the best physical condition I've ever been going to a race. I was literally running up and down Kilpatrick. I was in just great physical condition for mountains. And I rocked up out to Kyrgyzstan and I landed on the Thursday morning. Felt perfect. It was fine on the Friday. Woke up Saturday morning, not feeling very well. And the way it was going to work was it was a, a three-day hike to get to base. It was three base camps. And then we were going to run for five days, 230 kilometers. And I woke up not feeling very well and I won't get into a TMI situation, but I picked up a parasite and lost about six kilos in the space of a few days just because everything just, my weight dropped off. I couldn't keep anything down, couldn't keep water down, couldn't keep food down, had to go to the hospital in Kyrgyzstan, had to get literally Kurgs giving me all the tests to make sure that I wasn't dying. And it was one of those that that was probably my plan B in action. I always said that I'd never pull from a race by choice. But if yeah. somebody pulled me from it, then I wouldn't do. And I obviously wasn't allowed to start. I wasn't medically cleared. So that's kind of where that approach. And I was a bit stupid. I did a solo podcast on this where I was so in the zone because you get stupid when you're in these things. You get a bit fucking, you know, tunnel visioned. And I was like, oh, I might just, you know, tell the medics that I'm fine and like yeah. try and blag <laughs> my way through it, which is so stupid and reckless when I think about it in hindsight. But that's where my head was at. But then when I got home, it took me about three weeks before I was back right again. I had to get parasite stuff and a whole kind of host of different things to just so I could keep my food down and get my weight back up again. But it was a, it was one of those that if you know that you're going to back out of these things, you have to have this nearly tunnel vision approach that I'm going to do it and bar any act of God or universe or whatever, Buddha, whatever the fucking label you want to put in it, unless somebody else pulls me out of it, I'm going to do it. And sometimes you just have to have that approach, whether that's writing a book, whether that's doing a race, whether that's signing up to a gym or a personal trainer or a coach or running a business, whatever it is, you need a bit of that. I'm just going to run through a brick wall until I get there. And obviously you pivot if you have to, but that's just something that 
has served me. It helps me. It doesn't work in every scenario, i.e. the recklessness and my yeah. default of I might just power through on this. But in most cases, it served me well to this point. What's up, guys? Robbie here. I hope you are enjoying the podcast so far. I want to take a moment just to personally ask you for your help. If you're enjoying the podcast, would you be willing to share it with someone you think would love it too? Maybe a friend, family member on social media, or even if you just brought it up in conversation with someone you know. The recommendation means the world to us. And it's because of people like you that we get to be able to to produce this podcast on a weekly basis. So thank you so much for your support so far. uh, And I would love if you could help us reach even more people who could benefit from it too. Really appreciate you. And we're going to jump straight back to the podcast. I guess when it comes to that state of you, it's not really your choice anymore, is it? Like when in that state, it, it's not really your choice at all to, to pull out of the race. I heard you mention there that the race in the desert was one of the main or the biggest factors in your life outside of having your daughter that you had a, a change in mindset. What was, if you were looking at it on a, on a meta level, what were the, how did your lifestyle change after you did that? I no longer had any fear around things when it came to self limiting beliefs which sounds very woo but it's it this is no. this is genuinely what happened yep. when i came back from the sahara i had all these kind of little many self limiting beliefs that i had f- between relationships in business and just life in general and when i came back and from the sahara after the six back to back marathons i felt like i could have done anything And I still, that still holds, like it's funny because I've been knocked on my ass plenty of times since, but you still hold that confidence because you know what you'll do when shit hits the fan. And there's a lot to be said for somebody that, and I, I built a lot of my confidence over the years. I really struggled with this in my earlier life, my teens, my early twenties. I wasn't a very high self-esteem person. I didn't have a lot of self-confidence with the exception of sport. It's the only thing I ever excelled in naturally. You put me onto a football field, I was fine. But outside of that, I always struggled. I had very domain specific confidence within sport Mm -hmm. and then I didn't have it in other areas. And what happened with the Sahara when I came back was it felt like it spread into other areas. And there's a lot to be said that you know you can back yourself when shit hits the fan, regardless of what that is. Family member gets sick, the business decision is something's going on fire metaphorically or figuratively, you you feel like you can back yourself. And that's what the Sahara gave me. And it probably gave it to me because until I finished it, I wasn't sure if I was going to finish it. And that's the only time that's happened on any of the ultras. The Arctic, I tore my Achilles in the Arctic and I fucking dragged my leg 86 kilometers behind me. I knew I was going to finish it. And like my eyelids froze over and everything. But I knew I was like, look, as long as my legs attached to my body, I'll drag the fucker behind me. And so I knew going to that, I knew doing the hundred mile race. I knew I was going to finish it. Kyrgyzstan would have been the same. If I got to the start line, I'd have finished it. I didn't have that in the Sahara until I finished and got to the end. I wasn't sure if I was going to finish it. And I think that's why I got a disproportionate amount of confidence from it. But it does, it, it, like it comes from that. I think a lot of the people that I deal with now, are, it's obviously it's like long-term injuries is kind of the main people I deal with and it's confidence has been knocked to a point that they feel that their body is against them they can't do it and I know I know the, the, a lot of the populations that you deal with it, it very similar especially when it comes to fat loss where people have just completely lost that confidence in their body but I think that I, I think that a lot of us miss out on with that is that confidence where did I hear this go it was actually Alex Hermosi confidence comes through competence mm-hmm. once you complete one thing as you said like with the with the with the legs on the table once you complete one thing it just builds on itself. It continues to build on itself. And it doesn't matter how big or small that is. It could literally be, I'm going to work for three hours and not look at my phone. Do you know something as small as that to I'm going to run six back-to-back marathons in the desert? It's a small bit of a different thing. But obviously you can build on it to that point. When you look at that then, what was some of the, just for the people who are listening to, to give them a better understanding of it, is there any self-limiting belief that you really reconsidered? Any 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 specific example of a belief that you had to consider after doing that? Yeah, you made a really good point there about confidence too. And I just add that that works in the inverse as well, that if you don't keep those promises to yourself, you destroy your confidence. And that's an important thing for people to understand that that's a double-edged sword and works in both ways. 
And that's why mm. setting small goals and sticking to them and being very consistent with those small goals is important because that momentum can swing back the other way with confidence. And just as somebody that's done that in my life, it's important to, to throw that in there. I suppose the biggest self-limiting belief I had was it, it's a weird one. When I was on day five of Marathon de Saab, and that's the long day, it's where they, they sandwiched two marathons back to back and you run through the night. So I ran for about 24 hours straight, straight through the night. And about halfway through that, I remember having this kind of weird realization moment that why the fuck would I be putting time and effort and energy into something that doesn't map to where I want to go? And it felt like I was in this place and this sounds really weird, but I was a person that had this kind of I, I would spend time and energy on stupid things. You know, at the time I'd be fucking around on date naps and I'd be fucking around with dating and people that I knew was going nowhere, or I'd be talking and spending time with friends that I knew I didn't really want to be that close with just because I'm like, I'm bored. I'll go hang out with that person for a bit. Things I did in my late twenties more so. And I remember having this dawn realization that I'm 80, I'm 42 K in, I have another 42, 43 kilometers to go. At least I'm moving in the right direction. And I thought there and then everything in my life should be like that. The effort is good. The energy is good. Put the time and focus into the right place, but make sure you're pointing in the right fucking direction. And I took that with me when I came back and I got way more clear or more clarity on who I should be spending time with, what I should be spending time on, and what was the really important things for me. The relationships I talk about in Rewire Your Mindset, the 97-year-old rule, what would you regret on your 97-year-old deathbed, and where I should be spending time, energy, and focus, and with whom, so that I don't have those regrets on my deathbed. That was probably the biggest one I got, and I got it about halfway through day five during that race. Wow, that's it. I think that 97-year-old deathbed idea is a great one as well because when you look back on that and you think of all the all the ways that you can waste time and doing things that you don't really want to do or meeting people that you don't really want to meet, but you still do it because it's part of the old identity that you're still kind of attached to. And do you feel, did you find then that you had a new identity coming out of the desert? Yeah. Yeah. The language I used was I felt like one person went in and somebody else came out like a complete new identity. And that actually happened with the Arctic as well. They're the only two experiences in my life, race specific, where I felt like one person went in and another person came out for different reasons, but I completely agree, a different change of identity coming out of it. When you look at that then, what would you say are other points in your life that you've had significant growth in your mindset? But then also I want to ask you, what were the triggers to that growth? And then another very specific question, what was the year like before that growth? What was the year in your life like before that happened? Just one example or two examples. I've got two. One was before I ever stepped foot on a bodybuilding stage. My first ever show, which was in April 2014. It was the Miami Pro, which was my first ever show. And I came fourth in that show and did really well. But I was petrified before I stepped out on stage before that show. Like if you had given me an out, I would have ripped your hand off first, Robbie, because I was afraid people were going to laugh at me. I was afraid I was going to fall over on stage. I was just terrified. Like, and because I did that, not only, and I did quite well, which helped with the confidence, but the confidence didn't really come from that. It came from the fact that I would have taken your out if you gave it to me. Yeah. And I went out and actually was like, wow, I'm just actually showcasing the work I've put in now. And this is actually quite a lot of fun. You get to go out and do something that you've rehearsed and practiced. And this is quite a lot of fun. So I got that shift, which translated into other areas of my life in terms of basic confidence of not taking it out every time it presents itself. And that expanded and, and grew into and evolved into that no plan B that I used in the Sahara several years later. The second one then was probably when my daughter was born in 2015. And the year that preceded that was a weird year. It was probably when I was at the height of my mental health issues. And I, was, I felt really low. I had terrible anxiety. I wasn't sleeping, partly down to just fucking ramming my body with stimulants, trying to prepare for shows and travel around. I didn't have a good relationship with my body image. I didn't have a good relationship with myself. And then when she was born... It wasn't instant, but it was close to instant where I'm like, that's all bullshit and doesn't matter. 
and yeah. it, it got me on a path of I was prepping for the worlds in Las Vegas that August. She was born in May 2015. I had the worlds in Las Vegas in 2015, the fitness model world championships. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna do that show and then I'm done. I was like, I'm I'm getting out of this. I'm like, this isn't good for my health. I'm gonna be a crap dad if I keep living like this. I have terrible, my mental health has been the worst it's been. And ultimately none of it fucking matters. It's all bullshit that I've built up in my head as a big deal. So they're probably the two, funnily enough, because one served a massive benefit. The, the other did as well, obviously Holly being born, but they're both stage and bodybuilding shows related. So they, they kind of gave me different things. And that's why I think, and not everybody listening will ever do a bodybuilding show or run an ultra marathon or anything along those lines. But we all have series of moments in our life might be a breakup, might be a death of a loved one. You might lose your job, might've got a bad injury. You know this, Robbie, and that makes you reevaluate things. And as long as you do that reflection and you check in with what's valuable to you, what you're actually, what, what you want to do, that 97 year old rule, what would you regret more if you didn't do? And you're just doing that consistently, checking in with the process and making sure that you're aimed towards the outcomes, the Buddha quote, you know, don't expect to be happy at a destination if you can't be happy on the journey, checking in on the process, focusing on the outcome. You won't go too far wrong in any life decision you make. Yeah, it, it is. It is. An, it comes back to that, really. It's like the process and the performance, like what's more important to you. I think if you don't enjoy the process of it, you're not going to really get the most out of the performance. And the performance itself is going to be a lot more challenging. I know when I was boxing, that was something for me. It was like the the times that I had a fight coming up and I know in my heart and soul that I didn't put in the effort for it. My God, the nerves that you get going in there. <laughs> the you nerves know. that you get. Yeah, because yeah. you know. Yeah, you're not lying to anyone. But when you do have it put in, it's. Uh, I heard a great quote from uh, John Jones recently um, and he said that the butterflies are flying in formation. Have you ever heard of that before? Where he's no. like, do you know why you get butterflies before you do something? Yeah. He's like, well, I've all the preparation put in so the butterflies are flying in formation. So it doesn't make a difference. I'm going to use that. I'm going to harness that energy. And that really stuck out to me because it's the butterflies fly, fly in formation when you have the process, when you have really tacked on all the right things along that process. And it comes down to the performance then. It's just, is, 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 I guess, is where it comes out to enjoy or what, what you enjoy. Now, some of those points with the daughter, with your daughter have being born and the bodybuilding side of things, both of those are, I guess, obviously huge parts of your life. When you say you were going through a difficult mental health stage that part of your life. What what was it that was leading to that? Was it because you were doing something that you felt that you were transitioning out of? It was that you weren't enjoying the bodybuilding as much? You didn't feel that it was... I know you said it was your values. It wasn't something that you valued as much. What value was that against, do you feel, at the time? At the time, it was... I was having a little bit of a quarter-life crisis, I think, more so than anything. I... I'd spent so much time, energy, and focus competing, bodybuilding, doing that world. And it felt quite hollow to me. And I can't remember who had the quote, and we're, we're two of us are men for quotes, but yeah. <laughs> like the, you know, the, the two greatest tragedies in life is not getting what you want. The second one is getting what you want. And that's kind of how I felt with bodybuilding. I got nearly everything that I wanted for the most part. And I still felt the hollowness between b- below it. And that I think led to this kind of existential angst of what's the point of any of this. And I think we've all felt it in some shape or form in our life. And that's when I was at the most, because I wasn't really enjoying the process of it. I hadn't really met anybody, which is so weird. And I've talked about this with other friends who are ultra runners, like Simon, who I've done the Sahara with and the Arctic with is a really good friend of mine. And I've taught, and I've got other friends from ultras. I have nobody that I've kept in contact with from competing. I know Rob who competed, Rob Lipset, and, but we never competed in the same show and we know each other from fitness, not from competing with the exception of, I'd say Rob, I don't know anybody. I haven't kept in touch with anybody from that world, which leads to its kind of own loneliness that you're in the eco chamber together and you're all focused on your own respective shows, but there's no real camaraderie with it. And although I was making decent money at the time, my social media, even back then was what I called ab selfie wanker. Like I was all ab selfies. I had shirtless photos. That was my page. 
And that also felt hollow because I'm like, I'm not providing any fucking value to maybe some guys who want to wank off to my photos. Like, you know, it's not really <laughs> providing any values. Pardon the fucking non-politically correct <laughs> statement. Them. But that, that's effectively <laughs> what it was. And I, that just felt like, I felt like I was put here to do more than that. And that's where the pull came from, from two sides. And if you notice, there's a very dramatic shift in my social media presence from 2015 to 2016. I was very obviously transitioning out of that fitness model world into ask me a question. I have expertise on X, Y, or Z. I will try and help in any way that I can. And that's what I've been doing since then. And once I had that I started to get a bit clearer on serving people online, which brought more good people into my physical world, friends, family members, et cetera, that I spent more time with that. Those two things just combining and compounding positively. I won't say eliminated my mental health issues. It's something I've always struggled with. Thankfully, not as much in the last four or five years because I've got a good manage on it now, but it was something that just got better once I started to make better decisions. Like I'm the first to say, I've had a very privileged life. I've been very lucky with most things. Mm. And, but most of my depression or anxiety is self-imposed from making stupid decisions and being around bad people. And once I started to make better decisions, take more ownership that all the shit that's going on and how I'm feeling is because I'm putting myself into a position where I can be affected by these things, negative people, emotional vampires, you know, not talking things out and letting things build. Once I started to do that, a lot of my mental health issues started to alleviate. And then over the last five years, I won't say completely eliminate, but definitely under considerable control compared to then. Yeah, that's yeah, that's amazing. And it's surprising when you do start working in line with your values, how much of an effect that has in your life. It, it gives you such a, a level of motivation and even discipline to that, to that, to that thing. It, you, it's so much easier to stay on track with something when you know, I'm doing it for this reason. You know, I feel for myself anyway. I think that a big one, especially with when I'm looking at people who are coming back from like a back injury or, or a back issue and they had the value that they really like to be fit, but then they also have the value like that they enjoy short-term relief. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it's like you need to you need to judge here which one is going to be really more important to you in the long term. Now, I don't want to hold you too much longer, Brian. So I guess, how did you become a lot more clear on your values? Combination of consuming better information. I've had Dr. John Martini on my podcast and I read his book. I think it's the value ladder or something along those lines. That was one that helped me a lot at the time. It was a book that found me when I needed it. And it just, it brought awareness to the fact that I had a lot of junk values. I had way too much value placed yeah. on how I looked on my body image and even things like metrics on social media and followers, like junk values, things that don't make a bit of fucking difference. Really. They're not affecting the way that you treat people and how you are as a person. Once I flipped that towards being a better dad, better son, better friend, better partner, better all these things that one were in my control, but also were in line with my 97 year old rule. I I paired that chapter in the book with who will cry when you die, which is a line I got from Robin Sharma, who wrote the monk who sold his Ferrari. He was on my podcast as well. And he's a book of the title called who will cry when you die. And that got me clear on, well, these are the people who I value. These are the traits that I value in other people. I'm going to start to adopt those into my own life and become someone that's present with loved ones, become someone who's loyal, become someone who's not being negative, become someone who doesn't have an opinion on fucking everything. And there were values and things that I liked in others that I basically just took and started to nurture them, you know, metaphorically or figuratively plant the water on the seed or pour water on the seed. And once I did that, you start to build a new identity similar to what you mentioned earlier that you're proud of and that you're happy of. And when I was struggling with my mental health, when I was struggling with all these things, I wasn't happy with who I was. And the awareness came that I wasn't happy with who I was and who I would have been as a father or as a dad, which made me question who I was as a person full stop. And Sometimes you mentioned butterflies there. One of my favorite butterfly quote, which is different, that what the caterpillar thinks is the end of the world, the butterfly sees as a new life and as the beginning. And that's what I always think about when it comes to these crossroads that you're not feeling happy in a relationship, in a job with yourself, who you are, with your weight, with an injury maybe. 
and you decide I'm going to make a positive change now. And that's the start of something new. That's the start of something great. It's not the, it's the end of something, yes, but it's the end of something that's leading to something better. And once you remind yourself of that, it tends to give you that little bit of an extra pep in your step, that bit of inspiration, that bit of motivation that can keep you going when times get difficult because anything worth doing is worth doing well, but it's also going to be difficult on that journey. But if you know why you're doing it and you know what your values are and they're in alignment with it, it makes it way easier to stay fueled on that journey. Yeah, that's a, uh... Beautifully put, beautifully put. I think uh, the analogy there of watering the seed and nurturing the value, when you look at it from the top down level, it's just encompassing that idea of a growth mindset that everything can be changed if you focus on the right energy. Uh, Brian, I don't want to hold you much longer. I know you're a busy man. Thank you so much for 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 jumping on the podcast for the time that you did. And <clears throat> as I said, I really appreciate the work that you do. Is there anything that you can leave people with, I guess, as a final question, what is it? How? What did? What does it mean to be healthy for you? There's a question I ask myself that I think indirectly answers this, and it's on my whiteboard in front of me because it's the one I remind myself of most often. But I think it applies well to health here. And is the question is: Will this thing, or this person, or this activity I'm about to engage myself in, nourish me or deplete me? And I think if your answer to that is it's going to nourish me more often than not, you're going to be quite healthy. Food, training, sleep, or you can redirect it into romantic relationships or friends that are in your life or business decisions that you want to do. Is this thing going to nourish me or is this thing going to deplete me? And I I think if you use that filter, you can apply it to most things, health included. Excellent. Perfect way to leave the podcast. Thank you so much, Brian. Where can people find you? Oh, thanks so much, Robbie. I really appreciate it. Um, the Branking Podcast, Branking Fitness on Instagram. I'm on everything, but they're the two things I'd, I'd recommend people check out for sure. That's great. Make sure to check it out. Also check out BrianKeenFitness.com. Excellent for everything that, uh, that Brian has available for him. But uh, we will leave you all at that, guys. Thank you so much for everything. And we will chat to you all again next week. Have a good thanks one. again, Robbie. Okay, guys, thank you so much for listening to today's podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're looking to learn more about what we do, as well as check out any of the mobility and prehab programs we have available, just head over to the description of this podcast and you will find a link to all the programs there. As always, thank you for listening and I will chat to you all again in the next episode. Have a good one.